pretty much covered all the components required in a uh, serial link transceiver. We have the uh, multiplexer which takes parallel low frequency data to serialize and get a high, uh, high frequency data and then that is transmitted to the channel through a transmitter and then uh, the transmitter can have equalization. We have seen the general scheme for equalization. The semi digital FIR filtering works very well in the transmitter and in the receiver you have either amplifiers or uh, even a continuous type linear equalizer followed by decision feedback equalization. And also at the receiver we need clock and data recovery. This is regardless of whether you have forwarded clock or not because at high speeds you at least have to correct for the phase if not the frequency. Then to generate the high frequency clocks we need a phase lock loop because you have a low frequency reference that also we have seen. Now what we have not uh, concentrated too much on are transistor level circuits. Now again I mean <coughs> a lot of the serial link design like I said is engineering detail you have to uh, you have to sit and optimize the circuits. The variety of circuits is probably not that many. So, we will discuss some representative circuits in the transmitter and the receiver at the transistor level ok. So, first let us start with uh, transmitter circuits. Now, the channel is a transmission line and we know that for the best uh, pulse transmission we need to have this is the source voltage and if this transmission line has an impedance z naught we need to terminate it on the source side. as well as the receiver side ok. So, if uh, this is known as the doubly terminated case and <coughs> if of course, if the picture is exactly like this you have a transmission line alone and uh, a perfect termination then a pulse will go completely undistorted from the uh, left side to the right side ok. In reality there will be reflections and things like that there will be some small mismatches between the terminating resistances and the characteristic impedance. Even then uh, the best case is this doubly terminated one ok and there is an alternative implementation which is just using the Norton equivalent of the transmitter. It turns out this does make a difference in the implementation. We could also have in fact, if you basic circuit theory wise these two are exactly equivalent right ok. So, this is also doubly terminated, but this we call a voltage mode transmitter and this is a current mode transmitter. When I represent it with this ideal sources there is no difference in fact, this and that are the same as we know, uh, but when we make these things with transistor level uh, transistor level circuitry it does make a difference ok. Now, <coughs> the problem with double termination what is it? Uh, do you for see any problems here? Matching is there, but I mean in terms of efficiency what happens is the relevant signal is here ok, but essentially you waste an equal amount of signal in the transmit termination ok. And similarly I mean in the in case of the voltage mode transmitter you transmit some voltage and only half of it gets to the receiver the current is the same throughout the loop. Whereas, in a current mode transmitter you switch certain amount of current only half of it gets to the receiver. So, in terms of power efficiency this is uh, poor ok. So, but in terms of uh, signal transmission it is the best ok. 
the disadvantage is power efficiency ok. So, the only way to try and reduce the uh, basically this power efficiency is an important uh, parameter of uh, serial links. I think I mentioned this at the very beginning a uh, parameter that is often quoted as figure of merit these days is the power dissipated divided by the data rate in bits per second ok and this you can see it is the same as the energy per bit ok. That is the amount of energy that you dissipate in let us say I mean you can choose what circuit to quote this for right. I mean this kind of figure of merit there are lots of games that people play, but you can see that this is a figure of merit like for instance somebody could have a receiver with no d a no equalization and somebody else has a receiver with lots of equalization you expect that if you want to implement equalization you will end up burning more power. But anyway at least uh, you have to look at the details of what is being implemented, but for comparable stuff the lower this number the more power efficient it is ok. And if you look at uh, the prevalent numbers today if you do not need a whole lot of equalization that is let us say you look at the channel characteristics and at half the data rate the attenuation is let us say 20 dB or less than that I mean it is not as uh, it is not a very uh, it is not a much more challenging channel. Then the best energy efficiency is of the order of a few pico joules per bit ok maybe 4 pico joules per bit or 2 pico joules per bit 1 pico joule per bit is actually a sort of holy grail I mean if you can do that that will be great. Of course like I said there are lots of details I mean you cannot really be comparing uh, some equal as some uh, receiver which has just uh, one tap DFE with something that has a continuous time linear equalizer and a 7 tap DFE right. Obviously, if you make 7 taps you will need more power, but still the main message here is you should minimize the energy ok. Now, clearly in uh, case of doubly terminated stuff you will end up wasting half the power in the termination. So, that is a problem ok. Now, how might you reduce this? In this case the only way is to try and reduce the amount of uh, signal amplitude that you transmit ok, because <coughs> the smaller the signal the less the power dissipation. But of course, this has an obvious disadvantage you have a smaller signal to receive. So, that means that the likelihood of bit errors will increase. So, you cannot reduce it beyond a certain point. So, <coughs> the amount the signal swing typically is hundreds of millivolts. I mean this is what you can do also ok, because these days with uh, modern processes you have a supply of perhaps 1 volt let us say. Now, if you send a 1 volt square wave right that is actually very bad I mean if you try to send a 1 volt square wave to this side let us say using a current mode transmitter where the voltage here and there are the same. Uh, if you send a 1 volt square wave and assuming that half the bits are uh, ones then what will be the power dissipation if each though each of this is 50 ohms. Huh? So, this again like I have taken a singulated case I am assuming that the signal goes from 0 to 1 volt. If it goes from plus 1 volt to minus 1 volt it is a different thing. If it goes from 0 to 1 volt what happens is when uh, the signal is 1 volt the power dissipation is 20 milliwatts 1 square by uh, 50 and when it is 0 it is 0. So, on average it is 10 milliwatts here and 10 milliwatts there. So, in the terminations alone we have spent 20 milliwatts. So, you can see I mean the now we, the rest of the circuit obviously will dissipate power and that is a large amount of power. So, typically you send only like 100 or 200 milliwatts or maybe 400 milliwatts differential things like that ok. Now, sometimes uh, this is less optimal for uh, signaling. what you do is you terminate only on one side ok. In principle this is ok in that 
in this case there will be only one reflection and after that if RS is exactly Z naught the reflection should stop, but of course it will not be. So, you will get more ringing. Similarly, you could have termination only on the receive side. I mean this is regardless of whether it is voltage or current mode, you can choose to terminate only on one side and suffer some loss of uh, signal quality. The advantage is that you are not wasting power. Okay. So, we will just assume yeah. So, yeah, signal quality by that I mean I have not shown every detail here right. So, if I apply a pulse if this is an ideal transmission line of Z naught and this R s is exactly Z naught what I will get is I will get a pulse here the something is reflected it stops and that is it. Okay. Now, you will have some parasitic capacitances here and there and this R s will not be exactly Z naught. So, finally, what you will see is something like that. Okay. So, that is what I mean by signal quality and any type of uh, ripple there uh, will reduce the eye opening right. So, or if the slope is very slow then that means that you need more equalization and things like that. This is an experiment you can even do in the lab. So, if you take uh, these lower frequency oscilloscopes, they won't have any termination. Okay. So, you take a signal generator and connect a cable and just transmit a from the function generator transmit a square wave, you will probably see ringing. But then on the uh, at the oscilloscope end, right, uh, and the longer the cable you take, maybe the worse this kind of problem will be. But on the oscilloscope side, you can use this uh, these multi connectors, right. I mean it will look like a T. So, let us say you connect the function generator from here and here you can connect 50 ohms and then it will look a lot better okay, if it is terminated. So, uh, <coughs> unterminated lines always have a problem okay, because I mean obviously there will be a lot of reflections. So, we will assume that we will have doubly terminated stuff in high performance data links uh, that is what we will use. Okay. We can look at uh, how to realize current mode and voltage mode stuff. Before we uh, go further, uh, typically, although I showed a single ended transmission line here, we will always use, I mean, again in high performance stuff, the transmission is differential. The why is that? Why do we use differential signaling? Huh? Yeah, so what, where does the common mode disturbance come from? Now, let us look at the operation of the circuit itself. First, let me look at uh, a case where, so I have a voltage mode transmitter let us say and I want this. Okay. Now, this of course, is the I will assume that this is some ideal resistive termination and this is the transmitter chip and maybe I make the transmitter like this. It is just a CMOS inverter. I will assume that these transistors are large enough, so that it behaves almost like I mean the resistance of these switches when they are on is much smaller than this 50 ohms, so that it looks like on and off switch. Essentially what I am doing is connecting this to either VDD or ground. Okay. Now, what happens is the following, first of all we will not have just one of this, we will have many. Okay. And I mean although I show grounds like this, this is all very nice when uh, drawing schematics, but this will go to some V D D pin okay. and this will go to some ground pin and there will be number of other branches connected here. 
So, you know that when uh, the output of the CMOS inverter swings high, current is taken from VDD. When it swings low, it is pushed into ground. And this current, where does it go? It goes into the bond wire and a bond wire here. So, this is the ground on the board and this is the actual power supply which is connected like that. So, the voltages at the VDD and ground pins will be different from what you apply externally. And of course, you know that the drop across an inductor is L times d i by d t. So, here we have fast switching signals. The current through this right due to the driver will be a sharp current pulse with a large d i by d t. So, there will be a large drop. So, and you can imagine that when many of them are switching together, this gets only worse. So, this causes a lot of problems for uh, this uh, the supply lines which are probably shared with other circuitry. Even if you do not share it with other circuitry, simply to supply the amount of current required to switch here, you have to either use a large number of pins and bond wires in parallel, so that the inductance reduces or you have to use bypass capacitors on chip. I mean you typically tend to do both right, you have bypass caps on chip and so on. So, that the fast current pulses, what is the reason for using bypass capacitors? Huh? Yeah, so the <coughs> fast current pulses will be supplied by the bypass caps or high frequency currents will be supplied by the bypass caps. For this to be effective, the capacitor has to be physically close to this right. You cannot have I mean the capacitor also when you connect it, there will be a series inductance that should be small. So, you need to use large amounts of capacitance and so on. So, if you have single ended signaling, the advantage is you have only one pin per line per signal. Okay. So, if you have a 16 bit signal, you will have 16 lines, whereas if you have differential signaling, you have 32 lines. But on the other hand, uh, you will probably be have to be a lot more careful with the single ended signaling with the power supplies, because this is called simultaneous switching noise when everything is on the digital chip is uh, switching simultaneously, you have lots of drops across the uh, bond wire inductance and that can cause problems to this circuit as well as other circuits. Okay. So, in general if you look at the maximum frequency that you can go to that is lower for single ended uh, signaling than for differential signaling. Okay. If you have differential signaling what happens is ideally the way I mean if you design it well the current from the supplies do not change. I mean for instance, if you had a differential pair and you have this current source right. Now, when this switches from, so let us say this goes up and this comes down, the current switches to this arm and nothing goes there, but the total current taken from the supply remains the same. Okay. So, it does not have the simultaneous switching issue. That is why you prefer again for high performance links, you will have a differential signal. Is it okay? So, let us take a standard current mode transmitter. So, the way you would implement is with a differential pair. So, here I assume we will have digital signals. The digital signals can have whatever appropriate amplitude that has to be there and this goes to the channel. And there are also many options for the way you can connect the termination, we will look at that, but for now I will just connect the termination also to V D D. This is the source side termination, this is the load side termination and that is Z naught. Okay. This 
this is the ideal case, but there are some reasons to not do this sometimes. I will do come to that uh, soon. Okay. So, in this case, you can see that the total current taken from the supply does not change with uh, switching. So, this is a uh, good thing as far as the supply is concerned, but you will need two wires for transmitting data. Okay. What will be the received voltage amplitude? For uh, logic 1 and logic 0, what will it be? Uh, Vrx is between those differential lines. I not I not Z not ah. yeah so basically if we consider this condition let me call it R so if R S is R and R L is also R what is V R X I not times R What happens if this voltage is large? The current is all of the current is flowing through I naught. So, what will be the voltage here? Why? Z naught is not a series resistance, it is a characteristic impedance of the transmission line. Does it do anything? What is the DC impedance of the transmission line? What is the DC resistance of the transmission line? Huh? 0, it is just a wire, right. I mean, this is just a wire, it is like shorting this to that side. So, what is the voltage here? VDD minus I naught RS, RS parallel RL, the two are in uh, parallel, okay. So, basically, the swings are and the other one is at just VDD. So, the swings will be plus minus I naught. R S parallel R L and if both are equal, it will be plus minus I naught R by 2. Okay. So, I naught R by 2 corresponds to logic 1 and minus I naught R by 2 corresponds to logic 0. Okay. So, you have to choose how much this is. Like I said, this will be a few hundred millivolts. So, and R is fixed. Let us say R is just 50 ohms. Uh, then, I mean everything is fixed, right. So, if you need this to be 200 millivolts and R is 50 ohms. What is I naught? What will be I naught? That is what I want logic 1 and 0 to be represented by plus 200 millivolts and minus 200 millivolts at the receiver respectively. So, what should be the value of I naught? 8 milliamp. So, you need 8 milliamps. So, pretty much your transmitter design is done, right? I mean, everything is fixed. Okay. Now, given this, this is 8 milliamps, you have to size switch 8 milliamps. Okay. And whatever is driving this should be able to provide enough drive to switch this. I will not get into the details. You can either have these signals going from 0 to VDD, that is a good way to switch, but it will also send these transistors into triode region. If you do not want that, these uh, swings have to be limited to some other value. Okay. Because I mean, I think you know again from uh, digital buffer design that you cannot have, let us say, a single CMOS inverter which can switch a very large current because then its input current will also be large. So, you typically have 
when you have uh, 8 milliamps like this, you will have some buffer that has to drive this, that has to have some current, I mean hopefully like substantially smaller than 8 milliamps and that may have to be driven by a smaller buffer and so on. Finally, you come down to the minimum size gates, okay. How many stages you need depends on the process etcetera, but that is how it is, okay. You must have seen this right, the progressively increasing inverter size to drive a given capacitive load. So, how much do you increase the size by? Huh? Four stages. Four times. Depends on? No, okay. So, let us say I have a minimum size uh, gate right which is producing a logic level and the same logic level has to drive some large capacitance CL okay and what do you do would you connect this directly there what would happen the swing will become very low essentially the delay will increase a lot and so on. So, there is some standard uh, stuff that you must have seen a picture like that looks like this right where you have progressively larger inverters I mean maybe I logically inverted it, but you get the idea. So, so that the delay for this C L is minimum. So, how do you size this? Have you seen this before or no? What was the formula? C L by C in? Huh. Huh. Yeah, how many stages would you choose? I mean I wrote 3, I do not mean that you have to use 3 actually. How do you choose this? There is some uh, standard result right for optimum something you get some. Yeah, yeah I know it is always a geometrical progression, but what is the progression that ratio? It is E right the natural exponent it is 2.7. Of course, you cannot size it like that you size it 3 times or something, but if you work out the optimal stuff and you do the differentiation and minimize the delay and so on, you will get E that is 2.718, but I think you can use 3. So, then you choose the number of stages uh, based on the uh, fact that like for instance, if C L is 27 times this, you have to choose what 4 times or something, uh, 3 times I mean 3 stages and so on. Okay. So, anyway that I do not mean that you have to go with this formula, you simulate and see whatever works, but the obviously the progressive sizing is something that is clear right you have to do that. So, you have to size this to switch 8 milliamps you size the pre drivers appropriately. So, I am assuming you can do that with simulation ok. So, this is basically the current mode transmitter that is all that is there to it. This is actually what is used in very high performance uh, serial links because this works uh, very well the termination impedances are very well defined because you use these are passive resistances right this R S and R L use polysilicon resistors to define this, it is very nicely terminated ok. Now, uh, like I said ideally you should make uh, R S and R L the same as Z naught. Now, there is a <coughs> slight motivation to increase the value of R S ok. The reason is the following, because if you increase R S. So, uh, first of all uh, what uh, I have omitted from this picture are these parasitic capacitances here and so on ok. So, the termination impedance is not just the resistance that you put it includes all the parasitic capacitances that you have. So, the termination is very well matched at DC if you choose all the resistances to be equal to Z naught, but if you uh, <coughs> if you have parasitic capacitors as you go to higher frequencies it becomes mismatched because you have R parallel C ok. So, especially on the transmit side what you could do is you could increase R s let us say from the ideal value of 50 ohms. What happens then is for a given swing for a 200 milli volts you have to switch less current right. If uh, instead of this being 50 ohms if it is 100 ohms you have to switch less current to get the same 200 milli volt swing. So, if you have to switch less current you can use smaller devices which means that you will have smaller parasitics. So, if you use 100 ohms maybe it is not 100 maybe you will use 75 100 is probably too much, 
But what I am saying is, you use a higher resistance, it is mismatched at DC, but you also have a smaller parasitic capacitance, it is not degrading as quickly as you go to higher frequencies. So, you are saving power and on average, finally, I mean what matters is matching over the entire frequency range, not just uh, at DC. So, that may be a better option, okay. So, you will have, I mean everywhere you will have parasitic capacitance for sure, okay. You will have, so first of all, if you, you will have the chip, the chip uh, pins, the packages will have parasitic capacitance and then on that you will have a bond wire inductance and then you will have these pads which are basically these electrostatic uh, protection diodes, right. So, at least what you will have is, have you, are you familiar with these ESD diodes? So, every chip what happens is like especially at the input of uh, the input of a MOS gate, this is very fragile, okay. Meaning, you have a small area gate, the gate thickness is very uh, small also, the gate is very thin. So, if you let us say touch it with your finger, so I mean the input to a CMOS inverter looks like this, right. Let us say you just take this to a pin outside and this will never work by itself, okay, because if you touch it even the small amount of charge that is deposited will result in a large voltage across the gate outside and it will just puncture the gate and that is it. So, that is why you have this, you have seen this ESP protective packages and other things, I mean so that you do not build up lot of charge and you damage it. So, every chip needs to have ESP protection and for that one common circuit, this is not the only thing, there are lots of sophisticated ESP protection circuits as well, at least one thing is to have. diodes like this, okay. Now, you can see normally if this voltage happens to be between VDD and ground which is what you expect, both diodes are reverse biased, but if this goes above VDD the upper diode is forward biased, if this goes below ground the lower diode is forward biased, okay. So, these diodes will clamp the voltage to VDD plus 0.7, I mean to a range between VDD plus 0.7 and VSS minus 0.7, okay. But the moment you have this, you will have parasitic capacitance. I mean first of all, every node will have parasitic capacitance and these things will have a larger parasitic capacitance. So, the ESD stuff can be a big problem, you can just damage chips just by touching them, okay. So, they have to be sufficiently protected, so that when you accidentally deposit charge on them, the voltage does not build up to a large value, okay. So, that means low impedance, but of course, if you create low impedances everywhere, you have a problem for the signal, that is a big issue, okay. And this is particularly a problem with inputs, because the gate is an insulator, right. So, any charge there will just uh, does not go anywhere, whereas on the drain side, the transmitter output, the drain itself has a parasitic diode to uh, the substrate. So, that offers some protection. So, there will be parasitics everywhere, okay. So, this is the current mode transmitter and like I said, You can save some power while still maintaining good uh, high frequency termination, okay. Meaning you make it worse for DC, but you reduce the parasitic capacitance and you make it slightly better for AC. So, on, a, on average it could be better, okay. Now, like I said, the power dissipation is a very important thing. So, you can see why this is important. Now, of course, like uh, uh, like I said, this is a, uh, this is actually probably the best case for well defined terminations and so on, because we make these resistances with uh, linear poly silicon resistances. But of course, any on chip resistance as you know has a lot of uh, process variations. That is, uh, if you make a 1 kilo ohm resistance, it can be typically at least like plus minus 20 percent away from there. So, if you want it to be more accurate, what you need to do is let us say have multiple parallel units 
and switch the correct number of units based on some other uh, feedback circuit ok. That is uh, typically on every chip you have these uh, circuits which will let us say there is one external resistor they will compare an internal resistor to the external resistor and the internal resistor could be made as an array of resistors which are in parallel and you use the right number of them with MOS switches you can connect them in series or parallel. So, you make sure that the internal resistance unit is the same as the external one ok. Now, because the internal resistances are all matched you can use the same control for all the other resistors. So, you may have to use termination control to get very accurate terminations ok. Any questions about this circuit wise this is like uh, extremely simple there is not too much, but there are some details that you may have to take care of. You could do that, but uh, probably it is better to maintain R naught on one side and one increase on the others. And also, the advantage does not apply here, right? You well, if you increase RL, you could try to reduce this uh, transmitter size, but then I think it has to work only with this transmitter. I mean, if you have some other transmitter that it does not directly this increasing R L does not directly uh, translate to the any advantage on the receiver side it will be on the transmitter side. So, but this I guess assumes that this transmitter will work with this receiver which is ok which may be a reasonable assumption, but may not always be because you may have a receiver circuit which works with somebody else's transmitter circuit right. ok. So, that is why that is generally not done on the receiver side you use the correct terminals. if there is a yeah there will be reflection and it will go back and forth and depends on the reflection coefficient and so on. So, what that does is uh, if you just let us say do a 0 to 1 transition here, here you may get something like this or something like that or you will have to deal with that yeah I mean there will be reflections for sure because you have capacitors here there will be other impedance discontinuities it is not as though between the transmitter and receiver you have a single nice transmission line it could be like segmented you could have some transmission line some connector with reflection some other transmission line and so on. So, that uh, <coughs> what happens is typically let us say you design a back plane which is a large PCB and then you have some uh, daughter cards on it. So, the way this is done is experimentally somebody will lay out the back plane with uh, different transmission lines representative of what you see in reality and different daughter card uh, uh, types and then you plug them in and you kind of uh, measure it for a different I mean for a variety of set of uh, transmission lines and then see what you get based on either eye diagram or the frequency response what kind of channels you get ok. So, after that your transmitter and receiver have to be designed to handle that. So, anyway the bottom line is I mean if you have reflections or I mean the transmission line anyway is going to have a lot of loss. So, if it is a like I said if it is a long transmission line reflections are less of a problem because it get attenuated. So, short transmission line it is a bigger problem, but whatever it is you have to look at uh, just like for instance you design the circuit uh, including variations of transistors over process and temperature you will have a variety of uh, channels in a given application and you are designing the IC for this application you have to make sure that your IC works for all those uh, combinations of uh, transmission lines and so on ok. So, there are different ways the receiver termination can be connected they can be connected either to VDD or <coughs> alternatively I mean you can connect to RL like this ok. So, differentially it would not make any difference, but common mode wise it will make a so, each has its own advantage that uh, we will see and again similarly with the voltage driver I will come to that in the next class we will have these options. Now, how would we implement the equalization on the transmitter side? What do you have to do? Essentially, you will have to have these differential pairs like multiple differential pairs in parallel with 
bias currents uh, which are programmable ok. So, first of all here also even with no equalization you could make this programmable simply to program the amount of swing ok, because it makes sense if you have a very good channel if you know that you could program into a small swing. So, that it works well and consumes less power and then if you have more challenging channel where you have to transmit a larger amplitude you can do that ok. And if you want equalization I will show it for uh, 3 taps that is the cursor tap, a precursor tap and a post cursor tap. And these inputs will come from uh, different flip flops. I'll this signal is going from left to right. So I'm assuming flip flops with differential inputs and outputs. this is the transmit data ok. And then I have the clock right. So, the way I have drawn it this is the, the right one is the earliest bit, this is the middle and this is the later bit ok. If I consider the middle as the cursor, the right one is the precursor and the left one is the post cursor ok. So, this i minus 1, i naught and i 1 directly set the taps of uh, directly set the 3 tap values right. I mean if you have uh, the transmit uh, FIR filters response to be like that. By the way, it has to be connected correctly. I, I mean the polarity because this will be these taps will be negative typically you have to connect it in the right way ok. And you could also introduce polarity reversal for later taps if you need both positive and negative values and so on. So, I naught will set the weight of this, I minus 1 will set the weight of that and I 1 will set the weight of that one ok. And everything just sums together that is all. Is this ok? Now, what you do is you can make each of these variable and you would not set uh, you would not use equal currents and equal sizes and everything. First of all the transistor sizes uh, these sizes would be scaled with the currents ok and also the maximum current for I 1 will be related to the maximum post cursor tap that you need. Similarly, maximum uh, current for I minus 1 is related to the maximum is proportional to the maximum precursor tap that you need. There is no point using larger current than necessary ok. Then by setting the 3 tap values you will get uh, the FIR filtering ok. Now, the problem is as you have more and more taps do you see any problems as far as circuit issues are concerned? I not values why? Yeah, meaning rather what happens is that common mode wise all 3 currents flow through R ok, but uh, signal wise these will be subtracting from that because I mean the uh, this is a high pass filter right in the transmitter for the equalizer you need a high pass filter. So, the pre and post cursor taps will be negative they will be subtracting from the signal amplitude. So, we know that uh,
C minus 1 plus C naught plus C 1 is the DC gain, right. So, but the common mode current is simply the sum of these two, these three, okay. So, you can run into issues where this common mode voltage becomes smaller and smaller and you do not can't do not have enough room to accommodate the transistors, okay. So, in those cases you may have to use PMOS current sources from the top The reason is then these will provide some fixed currents and then the amount of current flowing through R will be reduced, okay. So, that means that the common mode voltage can be higher. If the common mode voltage is higher, it is easier to accommodate the transistors, okay. Like I said, there is a huge variety. If I go on listing like every little technique, it is uh, endless. So, I will only list like uh, some major issues that you may foresee. And you can actually, uh, once you are kind of familiar with let us say the analog IC level, uh, analog IC design level of uh, uh, competence, you can uh, either find solutions yourselves or uh, go back to the papers and see what they are doing and understand why they are doing what they are doing, okay. That is why I am not focusing that much on the transistor level details, especially in the transmitter there is not uh, too much. But essentially this, uh, this is like really high speed circuit. So, you design the schematic. The schematic simulations are almost worthless. I mean, you have to do the layout because the layout parasitics play a very big role at these high speeds and then evaluate the performance, okay. So, but this you can see now if I had like 5 types of uh, uh, equalization in the transmitter, the currents in all of them will add and then the common mode could uh, start falling too low for the comfort of these transistors. So, then you can inject these common mode currents and raise the common mode voltage, okay. Any questions about this? So, in summary, this doubly terminated stuff is best, and this current mode doubly terminated uh, uh, driver works the best as far as signal quality is concerned, but also this uh, when you have doubly term terminated stuff you waste like uh, half the current. So, that is a big penalty especially when you are looking for uh, low power implementations this is a huge deal. So, you try to either cut corners or make some compromises in some things and increase this or there are voltage mode drivers whose characteristics may not be as well controlled, but offer advantages in terms of